Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Did you miss us? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I missed doing the pod. He was Benji, as always, for the recap of Classica San Sebastian 2021. Bit of a low-key start list, given the Olympics had a big effect on the start list here. The big name, big favourite was Julian Alphilippe on Quick Step, who curiously didn't go to the Olympics because I thought he was taking a break from racing. But he's here with a strong team, David Irons, etc. Other guys to look out for, Juan Ayuso, young Spaniard on UAE Team Emirates, and Bernal making his way back from... Uh, his recovery, his first race, maybe since uh, COVID and the Giro Benji as well. As well, so they got a pre stuck team in EOS. But the parkour reminds me a lot of Liège, to be frank. 223Ks, and it's, it's got the highest cabal, but that's with like 63Ks to the finish. Then there's the Adelaide's climb, 4Ks, 11%. Steep stuff, longer than Liège for sure, but it's the 2.1Ks, 10% near the finish that reminds me a lot of Liège. Wet conditions in Basque Country, and then it's like 9Ks descent to the finish. So whoever goes, if you went over the top there, Alaphilippe, you'd have a pretty good shot at, at winning. Uh, but yeah, as I said, this show is brought to you by Cole. Benji had his eagle eye on the breakaway uh, and it's a pretty large break with not too much leash. Yeah, certainly. It was one of the large breakaways for these one day races I've seen in a while, including some decent riders like Conti and also Javier Romo, who went for KOM points, which is quite fun to see on a one day race. But that break didn't really play a role too much in this race when it comes to the overall outcome. So if we go further into the race where the race started opening up properly, wasn't really on the Ice Cabell yet. We had some attacks there. I think Mohoric went for a first attack on the Ice Cabell or just after that. And then we started the Edelites climb. And that's where people started moving in the peloton. And we had Landismo. He's back. Yes. <laughs> Is after, he uh, <laughs> Is uh, he? <laughs> He's somewhat back, okay? I'm happy to see him on a bike again. And that makes everybody happy. And Mikalanda goes for the attack on the Edelites climb. And he gets followed by Simon Carr from EF Education first and this was quite curious we still had some breakaway riders still up there but eventually those got caught and got caught by the peloton and it was those two riders at the front but Carr was dropping Landa and that was the sign that Landa is not in Giro form at all it's quite obvious it's his first race back so we're not expecting that but I'm honestly curious what you think in regards to like the, the Vuelta soon right isn't he going to the Vuelta? Yeah, I think so. I don't expect much, to be honest. Um, that's my honest opinion. <laughs> I'm more keen to watch, yeah, the comeback of Bernal, Padun, hopefully racing race in the Welter. I don't know. There's provisional start list, but, yeah, do you expect – this is Landers like cold, wet conditions, hilly parkour. I mean, were you kind of surprised that he attacked from 40Ks out rather than have Bahrain set it up for him to hit the uh, Murgil climb? I think that was perhaps the plan they had in, in mind that they wanted to try and go with Landa on this climb and wanted to use other riders on the other climbs because, like you said, I think they had Mohoric still Adon as well in this race. So they've got a few riders that can do something on this terrain and perhaps Landa was the early favorite to to go ham up that Airlights climb and make a break happen there for men or something, get away there. But Landa was unable to do so, but Gar actually made a solid gap 20 seconds, 25 seconds, and he went over the top of the Adelaide's climb, goes into the descent, and in the group behind, we basically saw that that group was so thinned down, and we had Trek Segafredo setting things up, still pacing with, I think, Antonio Nibali was doing some stuff in the group as well to, to keep on pacing and keep the group somewhat together. A few riders for UAE, including Ayuso, Kovi, and so forth. Alaphilippe still there for the Koenig quick step with um, Dave and Ains and also Honore, and after that descent, we saw another group worm its way away from the uh, Peloton Elite group, and that included four riders. That was Honore, Paulus, Rota, and Jesus Christ, how did I forget who's the fourth rider? <laughs> oh no, Mohoric. <laughs> Quite an important one. <laughs> so um, they eventually brought it towards Simon Carr, and they had a, a bit of a gap, and the cooperation behind was not that crazy with just the Muriel Tontora left to go. Well, Quickstep weren't pacing, which this is the curious thing. Quickstep have, have decided at this point to put all their eggs in the Mikel Honore basket with, yeah, with Alaphilippe, the big pre-race favourite and this murder Giedel climb that really suits him. EF are playing it perfectly, using their riders, who none of whom are probably the strongest on that climb out of the favourites group, but they've got good numbers and depth with Guerrero Carr and Paolo. So they're, they're, now they have two riders in a group of five. Really good for them. 
I was kind of surprised, Benji. I know Ineos pays for a little bit with Carlos Rodriguez, and I know UAE maybe pays for a little bit, but it was pretty much all I was seeing when this gap went out to a minute, and we everyone knows it's a minute, and it's sitting there in the 8Ks, run into the Miragil climb, 18Ks, 20Ks to go. I'm just seeing Gianluca Prambilla on the front. Why do I say it with Spanish pronunciation? He's Italian. Gianluca Brambilla <laughs> on, the, on the front. It's because I am, yeah, speaking Spanish every day now or trying at least, he, he's on the front pacing and for Giulio Ciccone or Balca Molima. And I'm like, why aren't UAE pacing? They've got Kovi in the group. Uh, Ineos had multiple riders, Carlos Rodriguez, uh, Adam Yates and Egan Bernal. Were you surprised that the other teams, I guess, kind of looked to me like they pretty much gave up, frankly? Yeah, it looked like they gave up and it was... Mainly UAE that only had like one rider at the front of the group and they had multiple riders in that group to still do something. So I was expecting them to base because they have COVID, they have Ayuso. I think Ulisi was still in that group and there was the La Cruz as well. So that's enough riders to do something. And if you're not at the front, you're not going to be competitive for the victory, obviously. And Ineos as well was one of the teams that I was expecting more of because they weren't doing anything either and had multiple riders in the group. So bit surprising from those but personally i don't blame the kerning going for honore and that was shown by the fact that honore was relatively good on the murgil tontora climb because that group that front group started the climb and directly we saw paulus going for an attack very early on not on the steepest sections yet just instantly and we saw that mohoric did not respond he chose to keep his own tempo which is probably a very good decision in hindsight because he kept crawling closer and closer towards the top of the climbs. And by the end of the climb, they were back together and they only missed Simon Carr. I think Rota, was he still on? I think he was still on and Onore as well. Rota had a bit of difficulties on top, but yeah, they went into the descent with three riders with Rota just like 10 seconds behind. So at the front of the race, we had Mohoric, Paulus and Onore. And when you look at that group, you say Mohoric, godlike descender, what is he going to do now? But he didn't go to the front at the start of the descent. And I was like, it's kind of normal because the gradient of the descent is that it's kind of falls flat downhill at the top and then goes down after like one and a half kilometers or something. So I wasn't expecting fireworks at the start of the descent. And he did go to the front when the steeper descent started happening. And that's where something happened. Before we get to the spiciest or maybe most controversial part of this race, a word on our show partner, LeCol. They produce performance cycling apparel. If you're riding, riding in similar conditions to the Basque Country today, they've got Haute Route jerseys, they've got Sport Gilets, Pro Wind Jackets and Rain Jackets galore. But if you've had the hot conditions that we've had here recently, there's the Pro Air jersey, there's the Monte Grappa collection, or there's the new lightweight collection for summer, which is made of breathable fabrics perfect for long climbs in hot conditions so the call of the support of the podcast since its inception last year if you want to check out their performance cycling apparel you can see it through the link down below or at www.lacole.cc but now onto this descent where morris was yeah leading he taken it easy i think over the top recovering because he'd caught palace palace had done a big acceleration palace better climber than morich but morich good at clawing those back after you see liege top tens etc he'll claw it back on the descent goes to the front there's this really tight right hand corner super wet and yeah he stuffs it pretty much he unclips as he realizes he's making the mistake unclips his right foot trying to counterbalance goes off his line all the way to the gut on the left hand side and then behind him rota and Honoré are trying to take evasive action. They hit uh, they hit a hard wall made of like stones, no protection on it, not sure. Don't even want to think about how whether there was a big drop off it. And uh, But luckily they, they crash, their bikes like bounce back into the road and they have no mechanicals. They get straight back on. But yeah, they've crashed and Paulus avoided it. He goes clear and then we don't really know what's going on. We have a camera on Paulus. We have a camera on... Uh, Honoré catching back up and Morris, we assume, is somewhere in between. But yeah, how did you see that corner, Benji? Did it remind you, I guess, of... Um, it reminded me of the way Morris crashed in the Giro where he just took, overcooked the corner and he, uh, yeah, he nearly crashed. And he he caused, in my view, the other guys to crash. Yeah, true. But it reminded me more of that crash we had. Was it in the Giro where Gaviria was in a breakaway 
And on one of the descents, he took a corner too wide as well. And he ended up also hitting a wall. But Mohoric was able to save himself and keep going. But the curious thing about this crash and the sad thing about this crash is as well that from this point onwards, you need to keep in mind, well, Mohoric and Paulus are a bit clear. Paulus is gone for a bit, has like 10 seconds on Mohoric apparently. We didn't know yet, but that is how it ended up being. And then we have Honore and Rota. Honore was the first of the two to get up because Rota crashed because the bike of Honore crashed back into the road, straight into the back wheel of Rota, which is just the most stupid way to crash. And it's not the fault of anyone. And it's so annoying, but that's how it happened. And Rota was the rider most affected by it and was completely thrown out of contention here. Honore was getting back up, was crawling back and was trying to make his way back. But the man just hit a wall. He's spending so much energy. This is taken away from all the energy he has. But so... At this point, you're thinking, well, if Mohoric wins, there's going to be drama. Like, somebody's going to put on Twitter, ah, oh, he crashed the other people out, and that's why he won. So at that point, I was slightly hoping that we would have Honore or Paulus win just for that Me too. to be avoided, to be honest. I think, yeah, the the crash, Mohoric, yes, he didn't crash, but... It's not like he took a perfect line. The other guys couldn't hold that line. No, he came off his line. He's beginning to crash and the others have to take evasive action because he's gone over his limit and gone off his line and they're having to break. So it's his fault and they're having to take corrective action behind him, although it is a sketchy corner. It also, he catches up to Paulus and then he starts pacing as well. So I was hoping Paulus or Honoré would win, as Benji said. Moritz, he came like third in a Tour de Hungary sprint, Benji, behind Aberastri yep. and, and Bauhaus. He's, he's a quick guy, yep. um, Moritz. So it looks like, well, they're going to make him lead them out. That's what they did. Honoré's quick. He came like third. In a, he's like top 10 in a bunch of sprint before. Yep. Third behind Sagan and Diego Ulissi. Long straight finish on the left-hand barrier. Moritz starts to lead them out from so, so far. Uh, too far, in fact, he begins his kick. And that's what costs him with Paulus getting a – like he was in his draft for so long, eventually comes out of it and just inches up past Moritz. We can't really see it live. We've also got Honoré trying to come out of Paulus' draft to the right-hand side. The only reason we think Paulus has won is because he's celebrating so enthusiastically, but riders have got it wrong before. We eventually see the shot on the line, and Paulus wins by four inches, three inches. Really, like, that's got to be the biggest win of Paulus' career. Uh, he's His been first in- pro win. Is it? Yeah, he once won a jersey, I think, in Joe Martin's stage race. I'm not sure about it, but... He it is his first pro win, which is insane to think about because wow. I swear this man has been in so many breakaways with Yumbo first and then Yeva and so forth. And the fact that he hasn't won yet is mind blowing and it's so fun to see him win finally. I mean, I've criticized Paulus uh, a fair bit in the past for his tactics in Tour de France breakaways, particularly in 2020. Not so much this year. I think he is mature. You know, he's 24 now this year. He's learning. Like last year, he was pacing hard in a break with Martinez or – no, not Martinez. Well, it was really strong climbers and it cost him. Uh, he got torched by, I think, Maida in a Paris-Nice break this year. Probably not much he could do there on stage seven. But today, he had to attack on that last climb. You don't want to go to the finish with Morich. They played the car, Paulus 1 2. He avoided played the crashing. The car. <laughs> played the Simon Kerr, he's French, Benji. Come on. <laughs> and um, yeah, a great win for him, albeit a reduced field and from the break. But I've got to commend EF on their tactics. They used their multiple riders in numbers, and I think they played the race the best today. And yeah, I'm really, really glad they got, got the win with Paulus, who's. A super talent. They've had Paulus and Coos win this month, World Tour, Grand Tour stages. So McNulty, no, actually McNulty Olympics, not good in the TT. But yeah, good from him. And Honoré, are we we're going to excuse Honoré and Quickstep, Benji? Because I agree with you, but you told me off air. But why should we give Quickstep a bit of a pass? Well, because they decided to trust Honoré in this breakaway. They did that probably based on some information. You mentioned that it could be the weather for Alaphilippe. He's been in shitty weather pretty badly in the past remind me of the Tirreno stage um, that Vanderpool won eventually he was just gone instantly when the rain started pouring but today Honoré literally crashed into a wall stood up 
had to chase back for two, three kilometers after that crash, came onto the wheel, had to try and crawl back to a little move that Mohoric made just before the final kilometer as well, and eventually still ends within a meter of this of this stage win. So imagine if he doesn't crash, he could have potentially won. You don't know that. So I, I'd say that their strategy to trust Honore was deserving for the lad and they clearly had trust in him today. And in all honesty, looking back at the race, I'd say that trust was deserved. Yeah, I mean, you think of, you know, we haven't seen any quotes we record straight afterwards, but my default assumption is Julian Alaphilippe does not like the cold and wet. He sort of 18 degrees and sunny. He's absolutely magic. Yes, Quickstep had the strongest team, but, you know, they still got a guy third. He, he, as Benji said, third by a few inches. He's hit a wall and come back. That has to cost him something in his sprint. Yeah. Honor is a legit quick guy. And, yeah, there was a lot of pressure on him to because that's the card they played, but I guess that is the quick step way. Maybe if Alaphilippe's like, listen, I, I feel okay, but I'm 5% off. And if, if he's if he's then not going to drop the guys ever reduce bunch sprint, you know, probably better to play the card they played. Maybe maybe they just stuffed it tactically. I don't know, um, but maybe Honor I didn't need to pull as much. I think the teams that are a little bit questionable would be Ineos and UAE, with Kovi being quick in the group behind, with Ineos having multiple riders. They seem to give up the ghost pretty soon after that break got forty seconds, uh, even though the break got pretty dysfunctional, but. Honestly, not a race I'll remember <laughs> the rest of my life. <laughs> the style list wasn't great. The, I don't really like the, the profile. It was rainy. I couldn't see what was going on. The production would focus on G3 for two minutes. But um, it's a World Tour race. <laughs> so, yeah. First one for Ayuso. The man's on the field it? now. It's his uh, second or third race for UAE Team Emirates. He was 18th today in that group that was behind. So he could have done some work for Kobe, to be honest. But hey. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm curious to see what he will involve into. If you don't know Ayuso and you're listening to this podcast, he's 18 years old. He's an absolute god in the races Weapon. he's done so far in U23. He's won the Giro U23. He's. I don't think I'm overestimating him if I say that he's one of the bigger talents in cycling that we have right now and that he's moving or leaning into a GC type of rider i don't want to overshout it and say he's the next pogachar but it wouldn't surprise me if he's the next great climber oh he's an absolute animal he's like 18 years old yeah yeah crazy crazy good uh ride maybe he doesn't you know who knows what could happen but yeah i think his next race is the sukito de getcho memorial then he does britannia classic uh, which won't really suit him. And then the Skoda Tour to Luxembourg, but just some low-key races, I think, to get him I think into it's the good. swing of things. Yeah, it's I was good. scared they'd send him to the Vuelta already, but they won't do that to an 18-year-old. I think next year's Vuelta and the year after, perhaps, Tour, if he's actually good. So, um, yeah, curious to see what he evolves into, and he's one of those riders you need to keep an eye on. Here's the top 10, which we always forget to do. Paulus first and Moric Honore. Paul Lorenzo Rota coming fourth. I would have loved to see him have a chance yeah. to sprint for a stage. Podium, he was actually in a break in the tour from memory as well. Kovi fifth, Alaphilippe sixth, Christian Odd Eiking seventh, Jonas Wingerhoff eighth. God, a lot of Scandinavians in here, making it difficult for me. <laughs> Gianni Moscon ninth and Balka Molima tenth. Bernal, he was in that group as well. He was in the group as well. So he's looking okay if maybe, you know, it's his first race back. So certainly looking okay and his training's okay. You know what a statistic I want found, Benji? What? What proportion of breakaways has Morich been in this season where the break was successful, even if it's not him winning? It feel, it's got to be the highest in World Tour cycling, surely. It has to be pretty high. I, I wouldn't know who else would. If he goes, you know, you've got to send like... a guy with him. There's probably like one guy that went in one breakaway and has 100% because that breakaway eventually won. <laughs> minimum like sample from size. People, yeah, minimum sample size, five breakaways. But um, I think that he's definitely one of, the, one of the top ones. But he's also been in a lot of breakaways in the tour that went nowhere and he went into attacks everywhere. So, yeah, I'm not sure if him attacking, then getting caught and someone else winning really is credit to him. It depends oh. on how long he was in the breakaway. True. I think another question I had was, do you think this was another scenario where the, the peloton underestimated Simon Carr? We saw it in maybe San Sebastian when, when Remco won. We've seen it a lot this year in both women's and men's racing where they're like, 
who's Simon Carr, 22-year-old. They let him have more time than if it was um, a, a bigger name rider and ends up then having EF having two riders to relay in a group of five. Well, this is a bit of an odd race because like, I'd like to pull us back to 2019. Remco won this race last time. And the way he won that was in a very similar way where he attacked before the final Murgil Tontora. And when he went, nobody started pacing. And on the climb itself, we didn't have too many people pacing either. So he was completely unmarked and they waited way too long to start chasing him. So very similar situation there. This time around, we had Trek pacing like a madman with all the riders they had and other teams just not doing it. So I think he fell asleep somewhere with 40k to go and realized they were in the San Sebastian race with 8k to go and then it's too late to try and catch the breakaway. So hopefully they put their alarm a bit earlier for the Vuelta. I don't know what's next for Nielsen Paulus. I do think he's physiologically a really, really good talent. I, I would a guy you'd have to send to the world to the stage hunt. Um, maybe he's in good shape, but he did do the Tour de France and he has fifty one race days already. So that would be a pretty heavy season for him if he does it. But we hope you enjoyed the recap of the men's race. Thanks to Lacole for supporting the podcast. Stay tuned if you're listening on podcast players for the women's and one uh, sort of self plug. I have is I've got a survey up on my main channel community tab uh, this evening if you're checking out after my highlight video um, just on some information trying to get some demographic information more than YouTube provides me about my viewers I think it takes about 30 seconds to fill out and uh, yeah if you want to check I'll that do out, it so I'll Benji fill it can in. do it all oh, right I, okay <laughs> Benji will troll <laughs> the answers I reckon so we need other people to do real answers so that it evens <laughs> out anyway on to the women's now ciao